Yeah. Yes. Good morning, Web Shadowers. Welcome to week three. We would like to thank you all for attending our session this morning. Today, we have the pleasure of hosting Dr. Alborno, an OBGYN. As always, please remember that the Google form will be posted in the comments at the end. With that being said, Dr. Alborno, you may start whenever you'd like. Hi, everybody. My name is Dr. Dana Alborno. And just to give you a little bit of background about me, I am an OBGYN. Um, I went to medical school at Loyola University in Chicago. I did my residency at the University of Chicago in obstetrics and gynecology. And then I did a fellowship in pediatric and adolescent gynecology at Toronto Sick Kids Hospital. My current job is that I'm an OBGYN generalist at Northwestern in Chicago. And I have a, like a niche in my practice for seeing younger girls with gynecologic abnormalities um, and having a pediatric and adolescent population in my outpatient practice. So today's lecture is really going to be one kind of a cursory overview introduction to obstetrics. And then we're going to do a bit of a more complex case in preeclampsia. So I wanted to have the introduction be pretty basic and just provide you guys with some definitions, some terminology that you would come across if you spent a day with me on labor and delivery. And then I wanted to expose you to some of the complex cases that we see here on labor and delivery and some of the more high risk conditions that we care for our patients with. So essentially to introduce obstetrics, you have to introduce pregnancy and what pregnancy is. Pregnancy is the state of having products of conception, in other words, an embryo be implanted in the uterus or occasionally elsewhere in the reproductive tract. When it's implanted outside of the uterus, that's called an ectopic pregnancy, which we are not talking about today. What we're talking about today is when a pregnancy implants normally in the uterus and um, grows through a normal gestation. Even in a normal state of pregnancy, there's a myriad of physiologic changes that occur in a pregnant patient and it affects every organ in the body. Pregnancy is divided into three trimesters. The first trimester ends at 14 weeks. And when we talk about dating a pregnancy, we talk about the gestational age and that starts from the first day of the last menstrual period. So it's not actually the time since the pregnancy implanted, which is a little bit later in the cycle because two weeks into the cycle is when a patient ovulates. And somewhere around ovulation is where the egg and the sperm will meet. And then it takes another about eight days for the egg and the sperm to make their way from the fallopian tube where they met down into the uterus and to implant. So for ease and for the sake of consistency, we always talk about the age of a pregnancy from the date, the, the date of the last menstrual period. Um, and when we talk about that, we divide our trimesters up into 14 week segments, starting with day one of the last menstrual period, ending with 14 weeks being the end of the first trimester. The second trimester ends at 28 weeks and the third trimester ends with delivery. Typically 40 weeks gestational age is thought of as being the due date and the end of a pregnancy. Some other important time markers in a pregnancy is between 23 and 25 weeks. The infant is considered, uh, or the fetus rather, is considered pre-viable or peri-viable. So that's really the edge of viability at which point most fetuses would not survive if delivered um, at that point in pregnancy. So less than 24 weeks is considered pre-viable and after 24 weeks is considered post-viable, meaning the baby would survive if delivered and had to you know, transition into outside life. The reason it's a range 23 to 25 weeks is considered periviable is because there's a wide range of outcomes within that um, gestational age. So it's a lot of counseling if a patient is going to have a preterm delivery or a medically indicated delivery 
at that gestational age in terms of whether or not the baby would survive on the outside with resuscitation. So the choice can really be left up to the parents in terms of whether or not they would want to attempt resuscitation. And a lot of that would have to do with whether or not the baby is measuring greater than 500 grams and counseling and consultation with the NICU in terms of some other markers of fetal well-being in terms of being able to predict whether or not resuscitation would be successful. Other important um, gestational ages to keep in mind is the preterm gestational age, which is considered anything from 24 weeks to 37 weeks. Now, preterm deliveries are a major cause of neonatal morbidity and mortality in the United States and in developing countries. When babies are delivered preterm, meaning before they are fully developed, it does cause um, a wide range of morbidity, morbidity and mortality because a lot of the organs are still developing, most notably the lungs and the neurologic system. So if a baby is born early, there can be many um, many sequelae of this, including respiratory distress, including intraventricular or intracranial hemorrhage. The gut is not still yet developed, so there can be necrotizing enterocolitis um, and poor feeding, uh, amongst a wide range of other issues, including you know, retinopathy of prematurity, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, and the list is really quite long. Uh, and the earlier that you are born, um, you know, really based on common sense, the more problems that you would have and the closer that you are to term, the less likely that a baby would be to have all of those problems of prematurity. Between 37 to 42 weeks is considered term, and then 42 plus weeks is considered post-term. Some other important obstetric terms to keep in mind is the word gravida and the word para. So a lot of times when you hear us talking on the labor ward or in our outpatient setting, we'll be talking about a patient, we'll say, oh, she's a G1 P0. G meaning gravida, answering the question, how many times have you been pregnant? Para meaning how many times have you delivered a baby, either term or preterm, but excludes terminations or miscarriages or losses prior to 20 weeks. So to give you an example of how we present these patients, it gets even more complicated when we're explaining the types of deliveries that a patient has. So a mnemonic that we use to describe this is TPAL, term, preterm, abortions, and living babies, meaning if I say a G1P0, that's a patient who's pregnant now for the first time and has not yet delivered any babies. If I say a G3P2002, that's a patient who's been pregnant three times, she's delivered two term babies, has had no preterm deliveries, no abortions or miscarriages, and has two living babies. Just by saying this term, I know that she's currently pregnant because she's been pregnant more times than she's delivered and um, more, more babies than she has alive. And then usually what would follow up saying she's a G3P2 is saying, well, how far along is she in her pregnancy? So then you would say she's a G3P2 and she's at 20 weeks pregnant, for instance. Looking at this next one, a G3P2103, that's a patient who del who's been pregnant three times, delivered two term babies, one preterm baby, meaning less than 37 weeks. She's had no miscarriages or abortions, and she has three living kiddos. This next patient, a G5P0050, is a patient who's been pregnant five times, but she's had five miscarriages or terminations, and she has no living kids. Um, and then this next one, a G3P3002 is a bit of a tricky one because she's been pregnant three times. She's had three deliveries, but only two living kids, meaning she had one either neonatal or pediatric demise. These terms can also be um, summarized in saying nulliparous, primiparous, or multiparous. And those are terms that we use often. You even might hear us shortening them and saying she's a nullip, she's a primip, or she's a multip. 
Null if meaning she's never been pregnant, prime if meaning she's pregnant for the first time, or multi if meaning she's been pregnant se several times in the past. In obstetrics, dating a pregnancy is everything. Dating means knowing how far along a patient is in her pregnancy, knowing when her last menstrual period was and when the pregnancy implanted. The reason it's so important is that it determines all of our management. It determines whether or not a baby could be resuscitated and survive on the outside if a patient is delivering preterm. We need to know how far along she is to determine what um, medical interventions would be indicated for her either to keep her pregnant, to, you know, try to prevent a pregnancy, to try to optimize prematurity by giving medications to help a baby's lungs develop or protect the neurologic system before a baby delivers, to know whether or not to induce somebody or keep them pregnant, uh, to know whether or not a C-section would be indicated or not based on their gestational age. I mean, dating is really, truly everything in pregnancy. Um, so the ways that, that we date a pregnancy um, in for a patient is one, we look at their last menstrual period. We ask them whether or not their periods were regular or irregular and whether or not they track their periods to get a sense of how reliable their recall of their last menstrual period is. And in best case scenarios, we learn of a pregnancy early and we're able to have a first trimester ultrasound that shows dating consistent with the last menstrual period. So with a first trimester ultrasound, that's an early ultrasound that shows a fetus that's still very small. And early in pregnancy, there's almost no genetic or environmental variability in how big the fetus is in comparison to how old the fetus is. So for instance, in later life, you could be 30 years old and you could be six feet tall or four feet tall. And you can't tell by looking at how tall somebody is, how old they are. But in pregnancy, um, when you're catching a very early pregnancy, there's actually a very strong correlation with how tall the fetus is and how old the fetus is. Now, the longer that the baby is on the inside, you lose that correlation. So when you're looking at a pregnancy in the third trimester, there's a lot more environmental and genetic factors that will determine how big a baby is beyond the age of the baby or how long the baby's been on the inside. So that's why an early ultrasound is really our best dating, especially when it's consistent with the last menstrual period. Of course, if a patient does not know their last menstrual period or has very irregular periods, then their last menstrual is not really going to be as reliable for us. And having a first trimester ultrasound or at least an ultrasound under 20 weeks is going to be a reliable dating method. Um, all of the other markers listed here are ACOG's criteria for confirmation of a full term pregnancy. So if you had a patient who came into you wanting to be induced electively um, based off of dating alone, we would use um, either an ultrasound less than 20 weeks, putting her at a gestational age greater than 39 weeks, or we would have to have it be at least 36 weeks from the time of a positive pregnancy test, or 30 weeks since we heard fetal heart tones on an external Doppler. Any one of those criteria would be considered sufficient to, um, to confirm that the pregnancy is at least 39 weeks and that it's safe to proceed with an elective induction. Another important thing to know about physiology in pregnancy is that progesterone is the main hormone of pregnancy. Progesterone is initially what is produced by the corpus luteum, i.e. the shell of the egg that was released from the ovary and that produces progesterone to stabilize the lining of the uterus in preparation for a potential implantation. And when there is an implantation, the pregnancy hormone level, or the pregnancy hormone, beta HCG, sends a signal to the ovary to keep the corpus luteum alive and producing progesterone um, to maintain the pregnancy until the placenta is producing progesterone and takes over and then the corpus luteum can wither away. Progesterone has a relaxing effect on smooth muscle, aside from um, the effect that it has to stabilize lining of the uterus and support the pregnancy, it also has a relaxing effect on smooth muscle. Now, 
the uterus is a smooth, it's an organ that's made of smooth muscle. So of course it's beneficial to the uterus to have a relaxation effect um, so that there aren't contractions in early labor and that you're maintaining a pregnancy by avoiding contractions. Now, the other effect that it has is on all of your joints, your ligaments, in smooth muscle, it's going to relax everything to make room for a growing uterus and to make room for a baby to grow on the inside. Um, the not so beneficial effects that progesterone has on relaxing smooth muscle is that it can cause constipation. It can cause reflux um, with a relaxation of the esophageal sphincter, which allows acid from the stomach to reflux into the esophagus. It can cause hemorrhoids. It can cause back pain from overly extending your lumbar spine and creating what's called lumbar lordosis um, and can also cause varicose veins and lower extremity swelling, all as a result of this progesterone relaxation effect on smooth muscle. On the cardiovascular system, this relaxation effect on smooth muscle is going to decrease your systemic vascular resistance by relaxing all of the vessels and arterioles in your vascular beds. This nadirs around the middle of pregnancy, around 24 weeks, and it's accompanied with an increased heart rate because when your vessels relax, it sends a reflex response to hormones in your body to increase your heart rate to maintain your blood pressure. And it also is accompanied with an increased circulating blood volume from, again, some physiologic changes in pregnancy that anticipate increased blood flow need to the uterus and also, in, also anticipate uh, blood loss at the time of delivery. So your circulating blood volume is increased by about one and a half liters in pregnancy. So that increases your stroke volume from your heart, which maintains your cardiac output in pregnancy. So despite the um, relaxation on the vascular beds, the increase in volume and increase in heart rate are maintaining your cardiac output. So what we see from a cardiovascular point of view in pregnancy is that by the middle of pregnancy, your blood pressure drops to lower than your pre-pregnancy values because of that relaxation effect on the blood vessels. By the end of pregnancy, the increased blood volume and the increased heart rate match the relaxation effect and actually bring your blood pressure back up to your pre-pregnancy value but it should not exceed your pre-pregnancy value. So I want you guys to keep all of that physiology and some of that terminology in mind as we go into a case. So I want you to pretend that you're on labor and delivery with me and we get called to triage to see one of our patients who's a 17 year old primate. She's a G1P0 and she's at 37 weeks gestational age. She's dated by her last menstrual period, consistent with a first trimester ultrasound. Her pregnancy up until this point has been uncomplicated, and she presents to triage with a headache that does not resolve with Tylenol and has flashes of light in her visual field. So the next step in seeing a patient is to gather more questions about her history. And that's called an HPI, a history of present illness. In obstetrics, the four cardinal questions that we always ask in our HPI is, do you have vaginal bleeding? Do you have contractions? Is the baby moving? And have you had any leaking of fluid? So those are the cardinal questions to keep in mind anytime you're seeing an obstetric patient. Um, that's beyond 20 weeks, those are all questions that are very important to ask as they can inform a lot of um, details that are really relevant to the pregnancy. The other aspect of the HPI is what you guys would ask any patient anytime you're evaluating a new symptom. And the mnemonic that I like to use is old CARTS, standing for onset location duration characteristics, aggravating and alleviating signs, as well as associated symptoms, radiation, timing, and severity. We would also ask questions about her background, medical health and wellness, asking about past medical history, surgeries, gynecologic history, medications, allergies, and family history. 
So for this patient, she has no vaginal bleeding contractions, the baby is moving, and she has not had any leaking of fluid. The headache for her started last night. It woke her up from her sleep. The pain is mostly in the front of her head. It's bilateral. Tylenol did not help. Being around light worsens her headache, and it radiates to the back of her head. She has associated nausea and vomiting with this headache. She's also noticed that she has more swelling in her hands and her feet. She's never had a headache like this before in her life, and medically, she's otherwise uncomplicated. She has no significant past medical or surgical history. Prior to getting pregnant, no significant gynecologic history. For a gynecologic history, we usually ask about the regularity of their periods, if they're heavy, if they're painful, if you know, she's not at an age where we're doing pap smears yet, but we ask, is your pap smear up to date? And do you have any history of sexually transmitted infections? That's kind of a good overview of what you would ask for a gynecologic history. She's not taking any other medications aside from her prenatal vitamin. She has no allergies and no significant family history. So it's a non-contributory non past medical history. For her physical exam, we get vital signs initially and her vital signs are notable for a blood pressure that's 155 over 95. Remembering that a normal blood pressure is 120 over 80 and anything greater than 140 over 90 is considered hypertensive for pregnancy. Her heart rate is normal, respirate is normal, and she's statting 100% on room air, meaning that the oxygen level in her blood is normal without additional oxygenation. On physical exam, so kind of moving from head to toe on our physical exam, we notice that she does have significant swelling in her face and her hands and her feet. We do a heart exam and we don't find any abnormalities. We do a lung exam, her lungs are clear to auscultation bilaterally. We palpate her abdomen and we do find that she's tender in her right upper quadrant. And on a lower extremity exam, we find that her reflexes are hyperreflexic. We ask our nurse to send some labs and we send a complete blood count. We send a basic metabolic panel so that we can check her renal function. We send a liver function panel so we can check her liver um, function. And then we also check a urine protein creatinine ratio, which is teaching us how much protein is spilling out from the filtration that happens through her kidneys that turns blood into urine is there any protein spilling into the urine from the blood that filters in the kidneys? So for her, we check her labs and her hemoglobin is normal at 12. Her platelets are kind of borderline at 150 and her creatinine is normal at 0 0.6. AST and ALT are liver function tests standing for uh, something I can't remember. I'm post call <laughs> Something like Alanian liver transferase and something like that. Um, and then her urine protein creatinine ratio is elevated with a urine PC ratio of 0 0.45, normal being less than 0 0.3, which correlates with a 24 hour urine protein collection of 450 milligrams in a 24 hour period. And again, normal for that is less than 300 milligrams in a 24 hour period. So based on newly elevated blood pressures in pregnancy beyond 20 weeks, based on protein being in her urine and a headache that's severe that doesn't go away with Tylenol and flashes of light, as well as, um, I think that's it actually from these labs. So based on her blood pressure, based on her urine protein, based on her headache and the new flashes of light, and yes, and her right upper quadrant pain that we noticed on her exam, she um, is diagnosed or that's diagnostic criteria that meets um, preeclampsia with severe features. And the treatment for preeclampsia with severe features is delivery, either via an induction of labor or C-section. I'm actually speaking, I think, on the 22nd of September about induction of labor and going to talk a little bit more about some indications for induction versus C-section and modalities of delivery if somebody is not going into spontaneous labor, so you can stay tuned for that. But essentially, the takeaway point for today's lecture is that 
the treatment for preeclampsia is delivery. Preeclampsia is um, one of the conditions that falls under the umbrella of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. Other conditions that fall under this category include gestational hypertension, preeclampsia with and without severe features, eclampsia, health syndrome, standing for hemolytic anemia, elevated liver enzymes and low platelets, as well as acute fatty liver of pregnancy. This spectrum of disorders is among the leading causes of maternal morbidity and mortality in both the developing and developed countries, and also a leading cause of preterm delivery and neonatal morbidity um, in both developing and developed countries. The way that it causes neonatal morbidity is both that it is a cause for iatrogenic, meaning you know, caused by doctors, medically indicated preterm delivery for maternal benefit. Um, so causing preterm delivery and um, sending a lot of kiddos to the NICU because of underdeveloped organs and needing help transitioning to life on the outside. But then also because of the vascular complications that can happen with gestational hypertensive disorders, that causes the placenta to malfunction and affects the circulation from the mom to the baby, leading to fetal growth restriction over the long term, but can acutely cause the placenta to detach from the uterus in a condition called an abruption. And if that happens in a significant way, it can lead to fetal hypoxia, meaning that the baby is not getting enough oxygen from circulation from mom to baby. Um, and it's essentially the equivalent of a stroke for a baby on the inside. So the reason that this happens is not exactly known, but the theories that um, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy occur actually come back to implantation of a pregnancy into the uterus. Implantation is a complex, um, complex series of events that need to occur to allow the fetal vessels from the implanting embryo to intertwine in a safe and healthy normal way with maternal vessels, where essentially the fetal vessels can branch um, and create um, a network with pools of maternal blood vessels where the maternal blood can filter into fetal blood vessels in a low resistance mechanism that allows both oxygen and nutrients to filter from mom to baby um, through diffusion. And essentially, if this process happens in an abnormal way, the maternal body is going to is going to recognize that implanting fetal vessels as abnormal or foreign, leading to an immune response that creates anti-angiogenic factors. In other words, cells that are attacking the vessels coming from the fetal vasculature. And this is going to end up streaming into the mom's bloodstream and the cross-reactivity of those anti-angiogenic factors or the cells that are attacking blood vessels is going to lead to both vasoconstriction, meaning clamping down of the maternal blood vessels leading to increased blood pressure, and is also going to cause increased vascular permeability where the walls of the vessels, the blood vessels are supposed to have a watertight seal, meaning that as blood flows through a blood vessel, there should be very minimal diffusion of fluid outside of the blood vessel. There's always kind of a homeostasis of the Circul the circulating blood volume and the fluid in our bodies that's both intracellular and intravascular as opposed to the fluid that shifts out of the vascular spaces and into interstitial fluid or interstitial tissues rather. And that's called third spacing. And preeclampsia and gestational hypertensive disorders affect that homeostasis. So as your vessels clamp down and as the permeability between cells and the blood vessels increases, what you'll find is that you have both increased blood pressure and fluid that's being pushed out into the interstitial tissues, causing swelling in the hands, the face, and the feet, and then also allowing for um, fluid to kind of extravasate into other tissues leading to end organ damage. 
the way that this presents with preeclampsia, not only do you have protein spilling out into your urine because the vessels that allow for filtration of blood into urine and the kidneys become leaky and allow protein to spill out into the urine. It can also cause kidney damage um, from the kind of clamping down of the vessels in the kidney causing kind of micro infarctions in the kidney, areas of micro strokes where the blood is not um, circulating appropriately to that tissue. And then that same mechanism can cause liver damage from those micro infarctions. And the liver actually exists within a capsule. And as the liver has micro infarctions, it starts swelling. So that capsular um, distension is gonna cause that right upper quadrant pain, sometimes with an associated elevation in the liver function study, sometimes without it. So we do consider right upper quadrant pain by itself with preeclampsia, a severe feature, meaning a sign of end organ damage. In the brain, this can cause a stroke or seizures. In the eyes, this can cause visual changes as you have micro infarctions in the blood vessels in the eyes. This can also cause headaches in the brain. And through the placenta, micro infarctions in the placenta and abnormal vascularity in the placenta can cause growth restriction for the baby. So a common thing that we see is our patients who have, you know, chronic hypertensive disorders, or they have gestational hypertension from an early age um, in their gestation, will often have a baby that is growth restricted, meaning is not growing appropriately, is growing on the small side because the blood flow through the placenta is limited or restricted. There are a variety of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, some that are more mild, some that are more severe. Anytime blood pressure problems start after 20 weeks. It's a gestational problem. Patients can have chronic hypertension, so high blood pressure outside of pregnancy that worsens during the pregnancy. But the case that we're presenting today is really about a blood pressure problem that is unique in pregnancy. It started after 20 weeks. For our patient, it started at 37 weeks. And she had a blood pressure of around 150s over 90s. And to have a diagnosis of a gestational high blood pressure problem, you need to have two blood pressures greater than 140 over 80 that are more than four hours apart. Um, and for gestational hypertension, that would be the only symptom that you have. You otherwise feel well, you have no lab abnormalities, no other symptoms, you simply have newly elevated blood pressures in pregnancy. What elevates this diagnosis to preeclampsia is when we're seeing some um, vascular permeability leading to proteinuria through the kidneys. So when you have mildly elevated blood pressures plus proteinuria, that's called preeclampsia without severe features. Preeclampsia becomes more severe when there are either severely elevated blood pressures with systolic blood pressures being greater than 160 or diastolics being greater than 105. When there's a persistent headache that's not going away, visual changes, all the things that we just talked about. Evidence of kidney damage with an elevated creatinine, evidence of liver damage with elevated liver function studies or persistent right upper quadrant pain. Um, Evidence of lung damage with pulmonary edema on exam, which would be a sign that the vessels that are feeding the lungs are becoming more permeable and fluid is seeping out into um, the pulmonary bed. And um, the each like breathing unit is now filling up with fluid. Um, or your platelets are decreasing. And the mechanism of how platelets decrease with preeclampsia is actually really interesting. So as the blood vessels are becoming really cramped down through vasoconstriction, and as the vascular beds are becoming more permeable, there's damage that's happening on the inside of those small vessels. And as damage forms, small clots can form in those blood vessels. And as platelets move through it and blood cells move through it, um, they can actually become damaged and break down in lice. So as your platelets are going through those small blood vessels, they're actually breaking down, and then your platelet numbers will actually go down. 
platelets being the cells in the blood that are responsible for primary clotting. So it's a very complex problem where you're actually having more blood clots form in your small blood vessels because of the damage that's occurring to the blood vessels. But that damage is making those blood vessels really narrow, which is actually damaging more platelets. And in areas where you'd want them to go and act to clot, then they're not there and they're not available. So it's over clotting in areas where you shouldn't have clotting and then where you want your blood to clot, then you're not able to clot and then you can bleed too easily. So the platelet number being down tells us both that they're at high risk for blood clots in areas where we don't want them and then high risk for bleeding as well. HELP syndrome is a severe subtype of preeclampsia with severe features where you have both low hemoglobin and low platelets because of the mechanism that I just described. And you also have elevated liver function studies. We say that this is a more severe type of preeclampsia with severe features because it's associated with higher risk for stillbirth and neonatal morbidity, as well as maternal mortality. So as we were just saying, these hypertensive disorders can occur anytime after 20 weeks, um, but they more commonly present in the third trimester. So more commonly, you'll see this with a patient who's beyond 34, beyond 37 weeks, but occasionally it can happen even in 22, 23, 24 weeks when a patient is in that pre-viable period at which point the baby would not survive on the outside. So if a patient develops pre-viable, or periviable preeclampsia, and the baby is measuring less than 500 grams, as it often will because preeclampsia that develops so early is going to be associated with an abnormal placenta and poor blood flow to the baby. So oftentimes, even at the point of, you know, usual viability of 24 weeks when a baby is usually measuring more than 500 grams, when preeclampsia is in the mix, and usually babies are measuring on a smaller side, at which point they would not survive on the outside. So with periviable preeclampsia, usually the recommendation is for a termination of, uh, termination of pregnancy, both because the mom could get severely sick and could die from the condition, which is proving to be very severe, and because the baby would not survive on the outside. The risk factors for developing a hypertensive disorder of pregnancy are related to three different categories of risk factors. One being related to the disease process itself, two being related to the immune um, process, and three being family history. So what I mean by disease related is that if a patient has a history of chronic hypertension or real, renal disease or diabetes, which already affects microvessels, or is in the extremes of age, either very young, less than 20 years old, or very old, older, well, not very old, but just old for pregnancy, greater than 40 years old, or has a condition called antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, which is a disease of the small vessels and causes clots in small vessels where they shouldn't form. Um, they are at higher risk for developing preeclampsia. With the immune-related risk factors, essentially, this is saying that the mom's body is more likely to attack fetal vessels as they invade if the mom does not recognize them. So if this is mom's first pregnancy from this partner, then she's less likely to recognize his DNA as being um, a benign antigen or less, or is more likely rather to recognize it as being foreign and to have an immune response. Another risk factor for this is no previous cohabitation. So if the couple hasn't been living together for at least a year, it's more likely that the mom's body is going to recognize the component of the baby's DNA that's the dad's as being foreign and is more likely to mount a more aggressive immune response as the fetal vessels are, as the fetal vessels are invading the maternal, um, are invading the maternal vessels and creating a placenta for blood flow from mom to baby. And of course, anytime somebody asks you, what's a risk factor for this occurring? You'll never be wrong by saying, having, ha having, hap having it happen, I'm sorry, I'm post call and I'm having a hard time with words. With a previous risk factor of this happening is to say, well, it's happened to them before. So anytime someone says, well, what's a risk factor for um, preeclampsia, you can say a previous history of preeclampsia. What's a risk factor for having a large baby? A previous history of large baby. What's a risk factor for a miscarriage? Having had a miscarriage in the past. 
So that's pretty much a safe answer any time in obstetrics and really truly any time in any um, field of medicine is to say, well, you know, they're at high risk for this to happen because it's happened to them before. And of course, if they have a family history of hypertensive disorders, both in and out of pregnancy, either in the patient's family or her partner's family, she's at a higher risk of having preeclampsia or other hypertensive disorders in pregnancy. So let's talk about management. Um, management essentially for preeclampsia with severe features, which is what our patient had, is delivery. And if the patient's beyond 34 weeks, then it would be really a no-brainer. But if they're before 34 weeks, then the risk of prematurity for the baby makes us think a little bit harder about whether or not the maternal benefit outweighs the risk to the baby. So in those scenarios, we really try to monitor a little bit more closely, give the baby steroid, give the mom steroids um, to help the baby's lungs develop and give the mom magnesium to help the baby's brain develop. The mom is less than 32 weeks. And we try to monitor the hypertensive disorder and see if things are progressing. If we can keep the blood pressures under control, then we try to keep them pregnant until 34 weeks. But if their liver function studies are continuing to increase, they have a headache that won't go away, their kidney function is progressively getting worse, there's really nothing that we can do to prevent that other than delivering the baby. So unlike blood pressures where we have blood pressure medications that we can treat, those other sequela or end organ damage of preeclampsia, we don't have anything we can do for it aside from delivering the baby and getting the placenta out of there. So certainly if there was a progressive end organ effect um, from preeclampsia, even before 34 weeks, we would have to consider moving towards delivery sooner rather than later. Aside from delivery, we have to manage the blood pressures, as I just said. So elevated blood pressures greater than 160 over, that should say 110, not, 10, not 10, um, are a risk factor for some of the neurologic sequela of preeclampsia, like a stroke, a seizure, um, intracranial hemorrhage. So we have to really be aggressive about treating blood pressures. So if we are inducing a patient's labor, we have to watch her blood pressures really closely. And if she does develop elevated blood pressures greater than that threshold, we would treat her with IV antihypertensives to get her blood pressures down into a safe range, less than 160 systolics and less than 105 or 110 diastolics, depending on the source that you read. As I said previously, preeclampsia is a risk factor for seizure for the mom due to that vascular permeability in the brain. And one of the things that you can do to increase the seizure threshold for a mom is to provide her with magnesium sulfate. Um, so during delivery and for 24 hours postpartum, we would provide mom with magnesium sulfate as a running infusion to increase the seizure threshold. We also are always thinking about optimizing outcomes for babies since we're delivering baby early. So we would get a NICU consult. We would provide the baby with steroids for fetal lung maturity. So there's good data that if the mom gets intramuscular steroids prior to the baby delivering, that those steroids can kind of spark increased lung development and help with the development of an important protein in the lungs called surfactant, which keeps the lungs open and able to um, have diffusion of oxygen from the lung into the blood flow through the lung. So surfactant is really important and steroids help a baby's lungs develop surfactant. Um, and usually before 34 weeks, a baby's lungs have not yet developed surfactant. So we give steroids to the mom to help with that. And between 34 and 37 weeks, if the mom is a good candidate, we'd also give her steroids because some babies before 37 weeks do not have surfactant yet and outcomes are better if they do get steroids, um, but it's a more of a marginal benefit in that uh, gestational age group. So if a mom has diabetes and steroids would make her diabetes get out of control, then the risks of getting steroids would not outweigh the benefits or the risks of getting steroids would outweigh the benefits to the baby. So then we wouldn't give them for instance. The last thing we would do to optimize outcome for baby is to give steroid or to give magnesium for what's called neuroprotection. 
So babies are also at a rate or also at an increased risk of seizures and poor neurologic outcomes if they're de delivered early, irrespective of the mom having preeclampsia. And that um, risk is more pronounced if the baby is delivered less than 32 weeks, even more pronounced if delivered less than 28 weeks. So irrespective of the mom having preeclampsia, if the baby is getting delivered less than uh, 28 or 32 weeks for another reason, either a medically induced delivery or the mom just comes in and labor, we would try to get in a bolus of magnesium sulfate to help protect the baby's brain. One of the other cardinal um, management points for preeclampsia with severe features is you really want to avoid fluid overload for these patients. So one of the things that you'll notice with the kidney damage that can occur with preeclampsia with severe features is that the parent or the mom is making a lot less urine. And usually we look at urine as a sign of hydration and fluid status. So it's not uncommon that in other fields of medicine, when you see low urine output, your instinct is to give a bolus of IV fluids to help um, improve the hydration status of the mom, especially when you see that the creatinine, which is a reflection of kidney function is poor and it's increasing, usually in other fields of medicine, when the creatinine is elevated and the urine output is low, you would say, well, the kidney's not getting enough blood circulation, so we need to increase the fluids going in to help improve the circulation to the kidneys. In preeclampsia, it's a bit more difficult because the blood vessels are all very constricted and there is increased permeability. So a lot of the fluids that you're putting in end up actually creating swelling in the surrounding tissue. So not only is the swelling in the hands, the face, and the feet going to get worse, but also the swelling in the brain, the liver, the kidneys, and the lungs is going to get worse. So one of the things that we fear most with fluid overload is pulmonary edema, um, which can occur very easily with low amounts of um, overhydration or, um, or fluid overload. So it's really a balance with trying to figure out the fluid status in these patients to maintain their circulation and maintain their volumes, maintain the perfusion to their end organs, but not fluid overloading them. The other thing that we want to monitor for is that we're giving these patients magnesium as a continuous infusion, and magnesium is cleared renally, and patients with preeclampsia with severe features can have renal toxicity or um, acute kidney injury where they're not actually able to clear the magnesium and process the magnesium so it can build up in their bodies over time. Magnesium toxicity can lead to respiratory depression for the mom, decreased reflexes, and if unnoticed, eventually cardiac arrest and a coma. So one of the things that we do frequently when we have moms on magnesium is we're going around evaluating their reflexes, listening to their lungs, looking at their oxygen saturation, seeing their level of uh, mentation, or do they have a normal mental status or is it altered? And then we would check a magnesium level for finding any of those things to be true. Um, and if the magnesium level is elevated, we'd obviously stop the infusion and we could give them calcium um, as an infusion um, or rather as a one-time dose for cardiac protection to to prevent a cardiac arrest from magnesium toxicity as their body is clearing out the mag. So even though um, delivery cures preeclampsia, the antigens, meaning the proteins left over from the placenta, are around in the immediate postpartum period for at least 24 hours. So we do continue our seizure prophylaxis with the mag sulfate for 24 hours postpartum. And, uh, and we do monitor those patients really closely postpartum. We do even have cases of patients who did not have blood pressure problems during their delivery, but they actually develop blood pressure problems in the immediate postpartum period because of those antigens that get released with delivery. So it's something that we monitor for both intrapartum and postpartum. And we provide all of our moms descriptions of the symptoms of preeclampsia. So if they go home and they start developing any one of those symptoms, they would know that that could be a warning sign for preeclampsia and to come to the hospital to be managed 
and the management would really be the same with the exception of delivery. So you're still monitoring their blood pressures, giving seizure prophylaxis, monitoring their fluid status, resuscitating any of the end organs that are getting damaged from, the, from preeclampsia. So in subsequent pregnancies, because these patients have an increased risk of developing preeclampsia, we would start them on a low dose aspirin in the first trimester to decrease the risk of recurrence. And we would also give these patients long-term follow-up with a cardiologist because it's known that patients who have preeclampsia in their pregnancies are at a higher risk of having hypertension and cardiomyopathies um, later in life. So they actually need good follow-up with a cardiologist for monitoring of their cardiac status throughout life. Um, and the last thing that we would check in the postpartum, you know, the more remote postpartum period is to check for antiphospholipid antibody syndrome if their status was unknown and they developed preeclampsia less than 34 weeks. That would kind of give you a spidey sense or ring your ears to say, hey, it's a little unusual that she developed preeclampsia less than 34 weeks. Maybe she has a risk factor for it and, also, and already has some kind of a disease that's affecting her microvasculature and puts her at a higher risk for clotting in those microvessels. So we would check her antiphospholipid antibodies, which is an acquired autoimmune syndrome that increases patients' risks for clotting and would be evident both with clinical history of preeclampsia less than 34 weeks or a history of miscarriages less than 10 weeks, a history of a fetal loss um, less than 20 weeks, um, or random blood clots in areas with no good explanation. And then that would further be substantiated with lab results showing that you actually have antibodies to specific protein antigens in your blood. So that's really all I have for our case on preeclampsia. I'm happy to take questions. They asked me to give an inspirational quote at the end of this. So I just want to remind all of you guys that it is a long road, but the years pass whether or not you're pursuing something you love or you're not. Um, so don't ever get discouraged by how far the destination seems. One, the journey is really enjoyable and it's a period of a lot of challenge and growth. So it's a lot like training for and running a marathon that even though it's challenging and even though it's long, uh, it there's a lot of benefit from even the journey of training and getting yourself to the finish line. And, you know, all of you guys for tuning in now, you're starting so early and you're all very motivated. I'm really proud of you for taking the steps to get some exposure despite the coronavirus pandemic. I have an Instagram handle where I post not that regularly, but occasionally about women's health issues as they come up or, you know, when I have time. Um, so feel free to contact me there for any advice or questions on pursuing a career in women's health. And welcome to this community of medical professionals. Um, you'll find that the people that you meet who are pursuing a career as a physician are some of the hardest working, most motivated and smart people that you'll ever meet. And it'll always push you to be the best version of yourself. So it's a very exciting career. And um, I'm lecturing again on September 22nd on induction of labor. So feel free to join us then if you're interested in obstetrics and you wanna learn more. Um, and I do have some other lectures on more gynecology related issues. Um, I can't remember the topics that I picked. I think I have one on um, heavy menstrual bleeding in adolescence and maybe one other thing, I think PCOS in adolescence. Um, and I'm open to take questions. So I'm gonna get out of this and stop sharing my screen. Um, and look at the chat. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Alborno, for taking time to present for us, even after post-call. We I appreciate know. I hope it was all sensical. Sometimes when you haven't slept in over, I, what has it been now, 36 hours, you don't make a ton of sense. Oh, we appreciate you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I really loved I'm you, and we back. learned so much. Yeah, of course. So I'm looking at the questions and do people having irregular periods mean infertility? And that's a really great question. And it really depends on the etiology, meaning the cause of the irregular periods and where they are in their reproductive life cycle. So for instance, 
adolescents and girls who are newly having periods often have irregular periods, and that's related to immaturity of the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis and is not reflective of infertility. Um, it's just re reflective of having an immature cycle, and with time, periods can become more regular. There are a lot of other things that can cause irregularity of periods, whether that's thyroid abnormalities, nutritional deficiencies, chronic stress. And when those things are corrected, oftentimes there's no problem with the ovaries or with getting pregnant. It's just you need to correct the underlying cause. So certainly irregular periods does not necessarily equal infertility. Um, and even patients who have irregular periods are ovulating sometimes, so they can get pregnant. So we always tell our patients, even if your periods are irregular, you still need contraception for birth control and prevention of unwanted pregnancies. And ultimately, periods are a vital sign. So if your periods are irregular, it's always a reflection that there's something else going on. So I would always recommend to anybody who's having irregular periods, whether they're heavy, they're infrequent, or, frequent, or too frequent, uh, to be seen by a gynecologist for evaluation of underlying endocrine abnormalities, structural abnormalities, um, or evaluation of nutritional status to make sure that there isn't any underlying cause that needs to be corrected. The next question is, what if there's a depletion of progesterone? Is this possible? If so, what could cause this? There is um, different causes potentially of low progesterone in early pregnancy. So one of those things is thought to be called a luteal phase defect, meaning that the corpus luteum, the shell of the egg that was released from the ovary is not producing enough progesterone to support an early pregnancy. So it's not stabilizing the lining well enough uh, to support an early pregnancy. So there are some studies that look at progesterone supplementation in the first trimester through 16 weeks until when the placenta would take over the progesterone production. Those studies are kind of soft. Uh, the evidence isn't really that good that it helps except in the case of very specific scenarios of patients with recurrent pregnancy loss who have vaginal bleeding in the first trimester. Um, and luteal phase defects are not really that common, so it's not something that you would see often, but it is one of those more theoretical things that could happen. Another thing that could happen is, let's say a patient has uh, ovarian torsion in early pregnancy, and for whatever reason had a hemorrhagic corpus luteum where her corpus luteum became oversized because of bleeding into the shell of the egg and caused her ovary to twist. And she was taken to the OR by someone who didn't know better. And they took out her ovary and they weren't able, or they took out that cyst. Well, that cyst is her corpus luteum, which is creating progesterone for her early pregnancy. So if you do that, you definitely have to supplement with progesterone until the end of 16 weeks, at which point the placenta should have taken over the progesterone production. Next question, what causes Black women to experience higher rates of these illnesses versus others? And have you seen Black women being treated differently during these, their pregnancies? So that's a really great question. And I would actually um, direct you to my Instagram. So I created an IGTV about increased maternal mortality for Black women. And the, um, the title of that lecture was called Black Mamas Matter, and it was a look into all the factors that affect poor outcomes for Black women in labor and delivery. Now, I'll say that likely the increased rate of preeclampsia is multifactorial, and because it's an immunogenic and a hypertensive disorder, it's possible that there are some genetic um, differences that underlie a Black woman's propensity to develop increased blood pressure. But there's also a lot of environmental things related to stress, access to care, um, treatment in society, anxiety, and concern about pregnancy uh, that lead to increased blood pressures for Black women at the end of pregnancy, you know, towards the third trimester. Um, so it's very multifactorial, and I think that I do a good job 
well, I hope I do a good job of explaining all those different factors that lead to increased maternal mortality, morbidity for black women in labor and delivery. And I would say that all of the things that I covered in there related to stress and environment and treatment um, and systemic racism, systemic injustice, all can contribute to increased levels of stress hormones chronically, which can put you at a higher risk of developing a lot of different diseases, preeclampsia being one of them. Um, and in terms of have I seen Black women being treated differently during their pregnancies, unfortunately I have. I mean, I would say that one of the things that I notice is probably that people's language sometimes about Black women's pain or their labor process or talking about their social situation. Like sometimes I notice that if it's a black patient, we don't call the father of the baby her husband. But then if it's a white patient, we're like, oh, is your husband with you today? Like there's almost an assumption that maybe, the, you know, a black woman is less likely to be married than a white woman. Um, so we don't inquire about like the family scenario in the same way. And I would say we just meaning like the medical community. I think you know, awareness is really important and recognizing the degree to which a lot of people are indoctrinated into practices and language that are not in a vacuum. They're not free from systemic racism and are obviously affected by racial bias and pregnancy and in medicine in general. Um, I think that that's the first step to correcting it. But certainly, um, I wouldn't say that we're there yet. I think we still have a lot of work to do in our community and in my um, field of medicine in particular. And I strongly encourage any women of color, any indigenous women uh, or black women to go into OBGYN because I think we, part of shifting the tide is to have more black women in our field, um, more black female providers um, to, change the conversations that are happening at the table, and then also to have more Black women available as providers for other Black women. And I think that that's really important. Um, and to be a part of the community that's doing the research and to be, be a part of the community that's leading the conversations um, and doing a lot of the advocacy work, I think all of that is really important. So that's all a very long-winded answer. It's something I'm really passionate about and something that I, think my field has a lot of improvement left to do um, and something that I'm hopeful is going to change in our lifetime. But I am very encouraging of Black women to come into my field. I think, you know, that's one of the steps of change is having more representation. The next question is, why does the condition wait until the third trimester to have an immune response? And that's a really great question. But I think ultimately, you know, the question, the theory of the immune response is just that, it's a theory. But I think one of the things that we, um, we suppose is that with more antigenic exposure, there's more of an immune response. So I'm sure you've heard stories of somebody being exposed to shrimp once and maybe having hives, and then the next time they're worse, and then they feel their throat scratchy, and the next time it could be like an anaphylactic reaction. So the longer that you're exposed to an antigen, the more antibodies that your body can make and the worse that your immune response can be with time. You know, certainly um, as the placenta gets larger and there's more vessels that are, you know, implanting as well into maternal vasculature, more of the placental antigens are getting into the maternal bloodstream. So all of those types of things are potentially contributory, but I would tell you that it's not an evidence-based answer. It's really more so a theory that's built on the fact that they note that patients who have preeclampsia have more anti-antigenic or more anti-angiogenic proteins in their blood, like S-split among others. But S-split is probably the most studied one, as well as like anti-VEGF. I think those are probably the two most common. So it's a theoretical explanation. Um, but you'll see, like, even if you buy a textbook on it, they'll say, you know, we're not really sure why this happens, but we think that it's because of these things. What other complications are associated with an expecting mother that has type 1 diabetes? Do these women have a higher risk of miscarriage? Type 1 diabetes, also known as pregestational diabetes, is associated with a wide myriad of complications in pregnancy. 
one um, of those is, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Congenital malformation. So if the blood sugar is not, con is not controlled going into a pregnancy, as you enter the early first trimester, which is a point in the pregnancy of organogenesis, meaning the organs are being formed, the body parts are being formed, those elevated blood sugars can lead to increased risk of malformations, including but not limited to cardiac malformations, neural tube defects with the spine like spina bifida and encephaly, meningocele, myelomeningocele, and things along those lines, um, and can also cause a rare congenital malformation called caudal regression syndrome, where the lower extremities don't form. And that would only be in scenarios where the blood sugars are really poorly controlled, because the reality is the baby doesn't know you have type 1 diabetes, the baby just sees what your blood sugars are. So as long as your blood sugars are well controlled going into a pregnancy, your risk for um, those malformations would be far lower and even you know, reflective of the general population of your blood sugars and HbA1c entering into a pregnancy are normal. Aside from malformations, um, patients with type 1 diabetes are at a higher risk for having a larger baby, are at a higher risk for needing a C-section, are at a higher risk for stillbirth, um, especially if the blood sugars are poorly controlled, are at a higher risk for a C-section, and are at a higher risk for having a shoulder dystocia where the head of the body delivers, but the shoulders don't deliver because babies who have, who are born to moms with type one diabetes that's poorly controlled have a different fat distribution. So their shoulders can actually get very wide. And even though the head can't, can come out, the shoulders can't come out. And that's really a true obstetric emergency that requires a lot of additional maneuvers to try to deliver that baby as expeditiously as possible because that's essentially a period of time where the baby is not having any blood flow and it's um, equivalent to suffocation. So we have to work really quickly to try to deliver the baby using some extra maneuvers. Um, other question, what made you pursue OBGYN? Uh, and I would say that going into med school, I never thought I was gonna do OB. I think I had a stereotype of what people who went into OBGYN would be like. And I don't know exactly what I thought that stereotype was going to be, but I just didn't think I was that. I felt like in a way it was like, I don't know, almost a sorority or something. Like you had to be a specific kind of girl to go into OBGYN. And I kind of imagined myself doing something more, um, I don't know if the word is kind of more introspective, something that required a lot more like intellect and like thinking and like taking time and having time to think about a plan and management. And I was kind of drawn to neurology. Um, but then when I was actually in med school, I learned that I really like doing things and I like taking care of things that are more acute, like you're pregnant and now you're not you know, our surgeries are a lot shorter. You have a cyst and then I took it out. Like things are kind of more acute and emergent in obstetrics and gynecology, but you also have long-term patients. So it's really nice getting to manage women throughout their reproductive life cycle and also having the ability to manage things both medically and surgically and feeling like your management has an end point. Like the things that you're doing help and create a difference. Um, so I really liked all of that kind of stuff. And I, I would say that, you know, whatever stereotypes are out there about OBGYN, I think a lot of them just come ultimately from like the chauvinism that's within medical training. Um, and I think there's probably a perception that women who do surgery are a certain kind of way or women who take care of women must be, you know, some kind of a lesser surgeon um, or something, you know, whatever it is. But, you know, those things kind of become ingrained in you, like you adopt those feelings without even recognizing that you're doing it. 
But then when I rotated on OBGYN, I just loved it. And I really loved the people. And I found that they were like truly my people. I got along with them so well. And I really cared for the patients, like from a genuine place. Like I saw myself, I saw my sisters, my mom, my aunts, my friends, and all of my patients. So it was just such a relatable, um, relatable patient population for me. And I would say that Obviously, we have wonderful men who go into our field, and they're one of our, you know, greatest assets and greatest colleagues, and we're really grateful that men are pursuing OBGYN still. And I would say that, you know, I would never want to deter somebody from going into OBGYN just because of their gender. Uh, and I, I think that I only talk about, you know, what it is to be a woman in medicine, because that's my experience. So I'm just speaking about it from my own point of view, but I'll, I have to state very clearly that a lot of my colleagues are men and they really enjoy the patient population, the mix of medicine and surgery, the mix of endocrinology um, and reproductive health, and also kind of the acute nature of the field. So certainly there's a lot of opportunity for men to go into the field as well and really enjoy it. Um, but, you know, I just speak from my own perspective as a woman. So the next question is, how does OB look for a sickle cell disease in patients? So with our initial prenatal labs, we get a CBC and we get um, a hemoglobin electrophoresis for patients who are high risk. And high risk for hemoglobinopathies like sickle cell or thalassemias would be patients who are of African-American or Mediterranean descent. Um, and then certainly if a patient has anemia that comes back on an, on an initial CBC, even if they're not of a high risk you know, population, we'd also send the hemoglobin electrophoresis. And on the hemoglobin electrophoresis, which is a study done to look at the composition of hemoglobin being the cell that carries um, oxygen in our red blood cells, um, which is made up of different proteins called alpha globulins, alpha globins, alpha globulins and beta globulins um, in different characteristics or in different um, formations. Um, and in sickle cell disease, they have a difficult time making the beta I don't know why I feel like I'm saying it wrong, the beta globin um, chain. And they ultimately can't make um, a certain type of hemoglobin. So on hemoglobin electrophoresis, where you see the mix, the types of hemoglobin that are around for patients who have sickle cell disease, they'll have hemoglobin S present in either a 50% or a 90% quantity reflective of whether or not they have hemoglobin or S trait, sickle cell disease trait, or they have sickle cell disease. Um, so we actually do a lot of screening for sickle cell disease and thalassemias in pregnancy because it does have a pretty unique implications in pregnancy. For sickle cell disease, it can put patients at an increased rate of uh, urinary tract infections and pyelonephritis, even if you're just trait for sickle cell. And then also if you have sickle cell anemia, there's a higher risk for um, having uh, poor fetal growth as a result of anemia and being symptomatic in pregnancy as well, because the baby takes a lot of your iron and can make your anemia worse. So there are truly symptoms that need a lot of management and monitoring in pregnancy. How is your schedule as an OBGYN? Is it strict or flexible? So truly your schedule can be anything you want. It just depends on what kind of a job you get. In OB, you have the opportunity to be like an OB laborist or a hospitalist, which means you just take shifts on labor and delivery and you can do as many shifts or as little shifts as you want. I'm a generalist, so I have patients that I see in an outpatient setting in clinic. And then I also take call and I also operate. So my schedule is probably a bit more strict than um, a lot of other specialties because we kind of have a lot of places that we need to be at once, um, both with managing an outpatient practice and being on labor and delivery and then also scheduling surgeries. And you gotta make time to do all of those things just for the variety of your practice. So um, in general, like compared to a lot of other attending positions, I find that OBGYNs probably have to work 
a bit more in terms of how many shifts we take per week and, you know, how long our shifts are and the amount of work that we have to do outside of um, actually physically being here to like follow up on results and do our charting and that kind of stuff. Um, for me, it's worth it. I like what I do. I really like my patients. I really like the job. Um, certainly, I think, you know, later down the line, if I wanted my schedule to be more flexible, I could always make it more flexible by either working somewhere else um, and taking a, a job with a different nature, either doing, you know, more inpatient or less inpatient, more outpatient or less outpatient. You know, there's a lot of variety in what you can do with OB. Um, and then what is the coolest case you've ever worked on? I mean, there's a lot. Um, residency is a really busy time and you get to do, and the reward really is that you get to do really cool and interesting cases. So, you know, with, from the obstetric side, I always like delivering twins vaginally. I always think it's really fun to do an internal pedalic version where after twin A delivers, then you reach in and grab baby B by the foot and pull it out. It's a complex obstetric procedure. Not a lot of people are trained in it. Where I trained me, tr trained in vaginal twins. So I love doing that procedure. I feel like it's, you know, would otherwise be a lost art. So I really like maintaining that as a part of my skill and practice. I like doing forcep deliveries. Um, there are occasional times, and actually they're very sad cases to be a part of, but from a surgical standpoint, they're very cool, where you have to do a hysterectomy after um, a vaginal delivery or a C-section for ongoing bleeding or abnormal placentation, um, like a placenta accreta or percreta. Um, and cesarean hysterectomies are obviously very complex procedures because there's a lot of vasculature. You have two patients that you have to think about. And the anatomy is very different. Um, but from, and from a patient perspective, I mean, it's a very sad thing to go through to lose your uterus during a delivery. Um, from a surgical perspective, it's a very cool surgery. Um, so I, I will preface that by saying for people who are going into surgical specialties, you'll kind of learn as you go along that what makes a cool surgery does not necessarily make a good outcome for the patient. I mean, at the end of the day, you want your patient to be alive. So if that's the surgery that needs to be done to keep them alive, you're happy to do it. Um, but, you know, it is considered a morbid procedure for them. Um, but it is a very cool case to be a part of. Um, from a gynecologic perspective, during my PEDS Adolescent GYN Fellowship, we had a patient who had a Sertoli Leydig cell tumor which is a hormone secreting tumor that actually secretes male type hormones. Um, and she'd probably had it for about a year before seeing us. And her symptoms were really pretty um, significant. She developed clitoromegaly, deepening of her voice, um, and had abnormal hair growth everywhere. And then when we took out the tumor, all of those symptoms improved. So that was a really pretty cool case to be on both a lot of pathology and a lot of medicine involved in catching that case and in treating it. Any other questions? Thank you so much, Dr. Oborno. Um, this was such a great session. We all really enjoyed it and can't wait to have you back. There are several questions in the chat and um, we don't know if you want to continue. Do, we can send it if you'd like. Uh, you should, why don't you send it to me an email? Um, and I can like write back to them, but I actually have to run to a delivery. So oh my goodness. I'm Thank you get so going, but it was really nice presenting to all of you guys today. I hope that you learned something and please give me feedback. Let me know what improvements you think I could make for the lectures. I really want them to be beneficial to you guys. Um, so if you feel like some of the medical stuff was too complex and you want it to be a bit more simplified or cover less information in a shorter period of time, um, we can, you know, I really want to tailor it to what works for you guys. Yes, Thank of you course. So much. Thank you. It was a pleasure to have you and we can't wait to have you again. Of course, mm -hmm. guys. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.